So we're going to cover a promotion, and that really is, uh, you get all types of different promotion, promoting to radio, promoting to television, promoting to press, and these days, of course, also promoting to blogs. And all these uh, different areas of the media are important. All of them have different benefits. Uh, radio is obviously one of the holy grails because you reach a lot more people through that. And uh, because of that, I thought um, I'd get Vic here to tell us a bit about um, how he chooses what he plays on his show and to give some advice on the, the do's and don'ts of trying to get onto, onto radio, not just on uh, Vic's show, but also onto some of the other um, also on some of the other radio programs there are. Obviously, if you get to a certain stage in your career, you might be lucky enough to get playlisted on one of the big stations. Um, that won't just mean that you get the promotional benefits, you'll also benefit from the PRS royalties and the PPL royalties. But I think from the stage that most of you are at, um, your main thing will be getting onto this man's show or if you're more folk music inclined or more country inclined then something like Ian Anderson on Radio Scotland and also if you've got a, um, you've got some something more indie inclined or rock inclined you might also consider trying to get onto Jim Gellatley's in demand program these are the these are the three shows that, that go out across Scotland the um, you should really be looking at at this stage. But I think that everything that Vic's going to tell you here will also apply to them. But Vic, I guess the first thing would be really just to start off and tell people how you ended up on the radio in the first place. Okay, I've just realized this microphone lead is trapped under my chair. Um, yes. I started uh, behind the scenes uh, in music. I mean, when I first left school, I, I wanted to be in a band. That was that was all I ever wanted to do was to to be a rock star. So, um, and that's all I did basically. I, I left school, got a, a crap job, and um, and then formed bands and went out and tried to do pretty much what you guys are doing right now: um, records, singles, EPs, albums, tour. Um, we played festivals, we played Tea in the Park, we played Reading Festival, we toured around Europe, we toured all over the UK, various different crap bands which went nowhere. But a lot of my friends stuck to their guns and became successful as musicians. Um, I, probably around the time I was about mid-twenties, I started realizing that um, there was more than just being in a band for me that I was capable of doing other things involved in music. So I started working for small labels, doing PR for labels, writing for fanzines, doing lights at venues, anything that would pay me 20 quid, 30 quid, 50 quid, whatever. Uh, and then an opportunity came up. A friend of mine said, um, who worked for the BBC, said this, this regional Radio 1 show is going to start happening in a few months' time. I think you'd be perfect for it. Um, I actually sort of turned her down. I said, nah, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm, I'm a rock and roller. I'm a punk rocker. I'm not going to uh, be a radio presenter. But then I thought, well, why not? I can potentially do both. So I applied, made a tape. It got accepted. I got narrowed down to the last two people. And then we became a double act. And that was with a girl called Jill Mills. So we, uh, we were on Radio 1 for five years every week together as a, as a duo. And it was called the, the Session in Scotland because there was a program called the Evening Session, which is now the Zane Lowe slot. Um, so it was the Session in Scotland, then Vic and Jill. Then Jill left, and it just became Vic Galloway. Then it became BBC Introducing. Uh, in Scotland on Radio 1 with Vic Galloway and I was I was on Radio 1 for about 11 and a half years simultaneously I got a, a job on Radio Scotland as well so I was doing the two jobs per week I was also doing various other bits of journalism and stuff and TV presenting uh, and then eventually I just, you know I'm too old and grey for Radio 1 now so uh, Ali McRae now sort of does the show that I used to do although it's changed somewhat but um, yeah so it was, it was basically just being a music nerd being someone that put on nights that played in bands that wrote for fanzines that did lights that did anything involved in music that would pay me a few quid that led me into broadcasting obviously having a, uh, a cheesy uh, voice <laughs> helped me get the job as well I mean it's, it's, it's got to be 
you know, simple as that. So it's the combination of being able to string two or three words together um, with this voice over voice. And, um, you know, my nerdy kind of passion for music that got me the job, and that's what I continue to do. What voiceovers have you done? Uh, the, well, are you, there's one that's still on. Uh, what is it? It's, it's about checking the registration for your car. <laughs> it's basically called my text check, right? I don't know. I think they might have updated it now. They might have someone else's, but you know, it paid me a few, a few quid. And nice. people, did you? Yeah, because some people actually who have my number text me and say, "I've just seen a Vauxhall Astra. Can you tell me how much it is?" <laughs> you're, you're obviously uh, doing a weekly show. You, the opportunities are there f to either get your to get your track played if you're in a band or you're a solo artist. And you also have acts on in session, so they'll come in and, uh, what's it, play two songs live and a cover version, is that right? Um, how do you go about choosing what to play on your show? What's the process? Well, I mean, we try and be as, as open-minded as possible. There, very quickly, the way that radio programs get made at the BBC. Um, I've never worked in commercial radio, so I don't know exactly, but I think it's similar, but, but possibly with less staff, I'm not sure. But basically, there's the Vic Galloway show has a producer and a broadcast assistant who's also the sort of researcher. The producer has the final say. They decide what I can and can't play. Um, so even though it's got my name on the show, it might not be 100% completely my taste in music 100% although I'm very lucky I get to choose a huge amount and I get you know a pretty eclectic playlist as well the way we make um, programs is we you know I go through tons piles of music my producer goes through piles of music and we get recommendations from friends and colleagues and other musicians and um, and labels and so on and so on blogs whoever it may be people will fire us music all the time now it's easier than ever because you can just sit in your pants in your bedroom, record a tune on your laptop, upload it to uh, you know, a SoundCloud and send me the link without even changing your pants, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's easier than ever. You used to have to go to a recording studio, get something pressed up and send it to uh, you know, whatever piece of vinyl or a CD or even a cassette. I listen to a pile of music either on CD, vinyl, um, or obviously, various different digital file formats as well. My producer does as well. We then kind of liaise during the week on email and so on. Um, I send her a list of things that I would like to play from Scotland and from you know international releases. Plus, uh, we have now a strand in my show, which is BBC Introducing. So uh, about once a month, we get money from the BBC Introducing kind of brand to, to have a grassroots band live in session. Uh, and I also play every every week two BBC introducing bands. I think these guys are getting played on my show on Monday. Um, I Redolent. Knew I knew you'd like them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna play them on Monday. Um, plus some electronic stuff as well. So, so yeah, so I suggest my BBC introducing bands. I suggest what Scottish releases I'd like to play and I suggest what international releases. Then my producer goes through it uh, and builds a running order. Uh, alongside the session guests and, and puts it into a format and then emails me it and then if I have any real problems with it I shout and scream digitally at her and then she changes things and it's we know we know each other really well now so it's it's kind of like I can be really honest she can be really honest uh, we don't agree on everything quite often you, you know it might be me playing a couple of records that I'm not madly keen on uh, but quite often it's the producer booking bands or playing records that she's not madly keen on so it's a it's a compromise um, so yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. We just go through tons of music and then, and then have a sort of debate about what we should play and who we should get behind. Um, what I'm looking for is ideas. It's really difficult, and I'm not pretending that it isn't difficult to sound original in this day and age, but I want to hear an original idea. I want you to try and you know, step beyond your um, influences and the bands that you've set out perhaps trying to sound like. I don't want to hear Biffy Clyro part two, or Frightened Rabbit part two, or Franz Ferdinand part two. I want to hear your band's identity. Now, obviously, you're going to be influenced by one of those bands, perhaps, or by you know, who, whatever kind of music that you're making. There are going to be people that got you into writing songs or making music in the first place. But I don't want to hear like secondhand stuff. I want to hear your identity. It's very difficult, but 
you know, no one said it was going to be easy. There's a lot of competition. There are a lot of people out there trying to make it as musicians. You've got to try and stand out from the, the, the crowd, and that's what I'm always looking for. Looking at it from a practical perspective, how do you like to receive the music? Do you want people to send you a link, say, to SoundCloud or a, a video on YouTube, or should they send you a CD? What's, the, what's your preferred format? I mean, I like physical formats. Um, I've got no problem with... I love vinyl and love CD and so on. Um, but if you can't afford or you don't want to press up the kind of physical stuff, then... Uh, a SoundCloud link or um, you know a Bandcamp link or something like that is fine. You can also obviously use the BBC introducing uploader. Um, I would what I would do is upload your tunes to the, the uploader, but I'd also email personally people like myself and Ali McRae and and people on Six Music who who use BBC introducing within their show uh, and give them a, a direct link to. Uh, to something. I really like we transfer. It's about as easy as you get. You know, you've got your files on your desktop or where, whatever. You go to we transfer. Um, it's free. You, know, you get an email saying your files have been sent. You get an email saying I've downloaded them. So you know that they've been, they've gone to me. You know that I've actually downloaded them. You don't know when I'm going to listen to them or what I'm going to think of them, but at least you get a receipt. Um, I would say. The easiest way is, you know, whether you're in your pants or fully dressed, is to to email me a link to something, okay? And I would I'd be fairly sensible about it. Don't send me 16 tracks. I mean, with every you know goodwill in the world, I'm not going to listen to 16 tracks of a band that I have never heard before. Uh, if I really love tracks one, two, and three, I might get back in touch with you and say, "Have you got an album? Or are you making an album? Or whatever." But three or four tracks is what I want. Um, a digital format is absolutely fine. WAVs or high-quality MP3s are good for me. Don't attach the MP3s to an email. That's another thing, because the inbox just gets completely crammed, and they'll start bouncing back. So a link um, to one of those sites I've just mentioned, or a WeTransfer link, which means I can download them. And if you are going to do a SoundCloud or a Bandcamp link, and there's a particular track, then make it downloadable, because I don't always have time to go, mm, I've listened to your music. Is there any chance you could make it downloadable? Thank you very much. You know, it's, it's easier. If I like it, I can click download. It's there in my downloads folder immediately. Um, a photo is quite good, but not essential. It's radio, but I, I quite like to know what the band are like, you know, um, you know, if they've got a sort of image or a kind of, you know, visual presence. Uh, an EPK is is, you know or a biog on a Word document. I mean, it can be as simple as you like. Just a um, name of the band, all the contact numbers and, and email addresses, the relevant ones. If the drummer deals with the business side of the band, then put the drummer's details there. Because if you get in touch with the band or a label or anyone, and they don't get back to you for days or weeks, it's frustrating. And it can quite often mean that you, you've missed the boat. So whoever's dealing with the business side of it, make sure there's um, the correct email, correct mobile phone number, any Twitter, Facebook, you know, websites that you've got. Uh, a little biog about the band. It doesn't have to be super in depth. It doesn't have to be, you know, another thing is don't say that you're the greatest band that have ever walked as well, because you might be, but I'll make that decision and other people will make that decision. If, if uh, you know, you guys are bragging about how you're the future of rock and roll, it's, it can't, I mean, some people may want to, I like a bit of attitude, don't get me wrong, but, I think, you know, just 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 something fairly straightforward, um, and what you're doing outside of trying to get played on my show. Are you gigging? Um, do you have any videos on YouTube or or on your own site? Um, have you been written about by other blogs? Have you been played by Jim Gellatly or Ali McRae or t Tom Robinson on Six Music? Who, you know, what else is going on? Because. Getting a play on the Vic Galloway show will hopefully improve your chances of being taken seriously and, and, and you know, it'll generate some PRS money for you and that kind of thing. But it's not going to change your life. It's not going to, it's not going to make you. Um, getting played on Zane Lowe's show is not going to make you. You know, one, a, you know, one or two plays on, on his show is not going to change your life. But if you have a, a whole plot going on, if, you, if you're gigging, if you've got like 10 gigs about to happen, um, Vic Galloway's playing you, Ali McRae's playing you, Jim Gellity's playing you, maybe you're getting some Six Music play, uh, a few local blogs are writing about you, suddenly a, 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 you know, a, a blog from down south picks up on you. 
you know, it just it makes everyone that little bit more interested because there are loads and loads of people out there making music. If you've got this little buzz going on, then tell the world about it. And the more you have going on, the easier it is to play on my show. In answer to your, your original question, something simple. Simple biog, simple picture, uh, all the song titles, uh, correctly mar uh, marked MP3s. You know, quite often, you know, I'll, I'll download a, a zip of MP3s and none of the tune names are on there. It's just like one, two, and three or something like that. I mean, make it as easy. Imagine you're getting sent something. Make it as easy as possible uh, for, you know, people like myself to, to, to discover and listen to your music. Could I just underline that as well? We've been talking a lot about pressing CDs. Um, I know it sounds really obvious, but I had this the other day from someone who should know much, much better because he's even older than we are. And he gave me a CD and it was just the name of his band scrolled on it. And Yeah, that happens to me all the time. It's just like, uh, at, at quite often at things like this, by the way, if anyone's got any CDs or anything they want to give me, please come and chat to me afterwards. But um, before Write you- Write your name and your contact details yeah. on it. Name of the bands, at the very least, name of the band, name of the songs, and a contact. Uh, because you know, and if, you, if you have CDs to give to me or anyone else, then go away and do that if they're just like a blank CDR. Because, uh, I mean, you want to see how many CDs are in my house at the moment? It's, just, it's obscene. It's ridiculous. So, you know, it needs to, you know, at least have the, de the, the, the correct information on it. Um, I think we're going to bring on the other, uh, the other speakers to start the promotion panel um, as a panel. Um, so I'm gonna move slightly to the side. If you, want to, if you want to sit there, what would be good is to go through some of the, some of the other things, some of the common mistakes. Ah, right, aha, smooth transition there. Um, some of the common mistakes that people make, we've just touched on one, which is the fact that lots and lots of folks still forget or neglect rather to put any details on the physical CD itself. You also get it with the tracks so you don't know if someone sent you an mp3 you don't know which act it is um, or have any of the the details there. The other one that was been mentioned a couple of times is the and it happens so much unfortunately that you get sent some enormous file and in fact, what happens with that um, is that you're, you're going to block someone's inbox. Um, and don't just think it's, it's for someone um, with, a, with a regular email account. If the Scotsman arts editor is away for a few days, um, his email box gets blocked. So that's a national newspaper. Um, so... This is, happens to lots of people. What the result of that is, especially if you've told someone not to do it and they do it again, is that you just start to really dislike them. And that means they're gonna be less likely to pay attention to uh, their music and what they do. And there's a couple of folk that will remain nameless for the time being, but um, I can name them outside. Um, where I've said, please don't do this. I'd really, you know, I, I'd like to be updated, but if you consider yourself a professional, do not send me a 14 megabyte file, um, especially if it's off a photo where you could just send a link. So Vix mentioned we transfer. Dropbox does the same thing. What was called you send it, it's now called Hightail, does the same thing as well. Vic also touched on something called an EPK. That, for those of you who don't know, is an electronic press kit. That's quite simple. With that, you want uh, um, your biography, which could just be a few sentences about who you are or who your band are. Um, you want a couple of tracks um, on there so someone can download it, and you want um, a photograph. And, I bang on about the photography thing a lot. Um, Ewan can fill you in on this as well. But while um, the panelists are talking, I'm gonna try and pull up a picture to actually demonstrate what this um, is about because 90% of um, artists get this wrong. A huge number of uh, professional promoters um, and event organizers get this wrong and it's something where if you have a photograph, 
you are miles ahead of loads of other people, and that's something that's going to get you that's going to get used and it's going to get you coverage because so many people get it wrong. So if there's one thing that I would say here to keep in mind, have a decent photograph and understand what, how it needs to be sent, um, point one. Point two, also make sure you know who you're contacting um, because... Uh, there's nothing more. Yeah, I mean, I, I can do this. this uh, anyone that's heard me do one of these panels before will know exactly what I'm going to say. Um, my name's Vic Galloway. There happens to be another DJ in Scotland called Jim Gellatley, right? Okay, monosyllabic first name, three syllables in the second name, with a G at the beginning as well. Wow! But I tell you what, our shows are quite different. Even though we do, there is a sort of crossover point where we will be playing some of the same bands and artists but we are quite different and uh, Jim works for a completely different radio station blah 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 I still get emails to this day saying dear Jim uh, la, 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 we're great we're the future of rock and roll check us out you know um, just I know everyone's gonna I cut and paste emails but just before you click send just make sure that you're sending it to Jim or Vic or Ali or Scott, or Olaf, or Tallow, whoever it may be, right? Just just do that last thing. Also, investigate who you're actually sending your stuff to. F listen to the Vic Galloway show. Check out the track listings. It's all up on the iPlayer for a week after broadcast. There's no excuse. It doesn't matter who you're sending it to, uh, whether it be a radio show or a blog or anything. Check out that what you're doing might potentially connect with... The, the people that you're sending it to. If you're a death metal um, band and you're sending your stuff to a folk show, it's a waste. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of time. And if you're pressing up CDs or vinyl, it's a, it's, you know, it's a waste of money as well. So just do a little bit of research. And when you are sending people emails and links, be polite, straightforward. Don't like send them an essay, uh, just a few lines, and don't hassle them like the next day. Have you listened yet? What, what did you think? Are, are you into it? Uh, I, I haven't even checked my inbox, you know. Give a two or three weeks maybe before the first reminder email and then maybe a couple of weeks after that. You know, you can be firm and let, I really want some feedback from you, you know, listen to the program or read your column or whatever it is. Can you let me know? But if you hassle them every single day, they will hate you and they probably you will actually put them off your music more than anything else. We touched on timing earlier on, and I think this is, uh, you just mentioned it as well, in terms of when you should get back in touch with someone, but I think the, um, there are different time, time considerations. On radio, how soon before you plan to release something should people be sending you their music? Well, if, if you're releasing something, say, Monday the 7th of October coming up, um, then I would want it about a month to six weeks before that, if possible. Uh, that gives me a chance to receive it, listen to it, listen to it maybe again. If I, you know, if I'm honest, there are, there are three piles. Is the when I listen to stuff, there's a yep, like this pile. There's the shite pile, and then there's the kind of uh, I'm not sure about this pile, which is always the biggest one. So you listen to something good, shite, or mm, I'll go back to that, and that's always the largest one. That's the one that I go back to. So. S say six weeks before some people send us stuff like eight ten weeks before a release that's cool but sometimes that's too much and you can f forget all about it uh, but then two weeks before a release is too soon about a month to six weeks i reckon is good S be safe and say six weeks um Tala, the ideal time for you to be able to promote a gig if you're promoting a gig from Booking the band, how long would you like to actually work on that and get the get the press At in place? At least the same length of time, so a month to six weeks, because that's um, it's all based on listings, really. So the list and the skinny all have set deadlines. So for the November issue of the skinny, the deadline for that is the middle of October. So it's usually like around about the 14th of October. And for the list, uh, they, they are kind of every four weeks. So they want to have it kind of six weeks before. They, they're, it's quite, it's a good length of time for us to get the promo together as well. Because once we get the blogs and the artwork um, and we start putting a poster together, um, then you've got print time for it coming back from the printers and everything. And you want to just have as much time as possible. But that's a kind of good amount of time um, 
anything less than four weeks, it's almost too risky. Two weeks is crazy. Um, for a support band, though, that can be perfect. Uh, but if it's a headline, then not. But if it's a support band, because it's always different, it depends if we're allowed to add, as I was saying earlier on today, it depends if we're allowed to actually even add a local support. And sometimes they'll tell us the day that the gig is booked, and sometimes they'll tell us a week before. So um, just always get in touch with us. But if it's for a headline show, we need more time. Scott, how long should someone prepare in advance of putting out a physical release? Uh, yeah, six weeks is the, the very earliest. Um, you what's the ideal? What's ide as long the as ideal possible? Time I mean, for some, you? some labels will go for um, three months. You know, they'll drag it out as long as they can. Um, the longest lead time is is um, magazines, print magazines. You know, Q and all these. They they're looking for uh, six weeks. They wouldn't even look at it unless it was six weeks. Um, but you know, again, that's uh, you know, you can and, and you can work with magazines. I've phoned magazines and said, when would you like me to release this so that you can write about it. And they've said, well, if you release it around this time, we'll write about it. And then I've set the release time to what they've told me works for them, if you know what I mean. And then uh, you can go from that. So it's not, it's not set in stone, but as, as long as possible, six week minimum. What about with uh, a digital release? What would your ideal time, or what would be the minimum yeah, time you'd recommend? Yeah, there's kind of two ways to kind of consider for, from a digital release. Um, if you're just looking to get something turned around, turned around to get it up on store, then as I kind of touched on earlier on, that's not really going to take, some stores are going to, as I say, iTunes is going to do in a couple of days, most places are going to be within a week, 10 days. Um, however, if you are interested in trying to get any sort of feature or any sort of editorial placement on these stores, then it's generally around about the kind of six, six week mark as well. Um, there's going to be some stores that are able to do some stuff within that if you don't have that much lead-in time, but to be considered for the complete kind of range of opportunities that are available, then we would always advise a kind of minimum of six weeks. As a couple of guys have said, there's, there's, you can't really allow too much lead-in time with, with that side of things. Um, so, yeah, between, between four and six weeks, ideally, ideally six weeks. I think another thing to keep in mind, and I say this wearing my journalist hat, what happens is people will tip me off about something um, a good few few weeks in advance. It could be six months, sorry, six weeks or something. It comes to my deadline, and sometimes I've just forgotten. So it's really worthwhile um, letting someone know, but then reminding them closer at the time. I'll generally say to folk, if it's a long time ahead, can you give me a shout on... Um, you know, the maybe the last uh, the last Wednesday of the month because um, I'll have to be or the first uh, or the last Monday of a month because that way that's two days before or three days before I have to submit my column. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, there is um, different people have different ways of working, but something that's really worth doing and Scott's touched on this is actually contacting the journalist and contacting the publication and finding out when their deadline is. Um, that's something that really is, uh, is worth doing because there's sometimes I'll love something, but it'll just come in too late. And I've had this where someone's got in touch with me the day afterwards, the day after I've sent off my column, and I've said, I'd love to have written about that, but you've, you left it too late. And it's one of the most common mistakes that bands and um, artists make is that they'll they'll go, we're releasing an album next week, uh, right, we better contact some journalists. And so you spend all this time making an album, all the, the work that that involves, and then at the final stage, it's, uh, it's screwed up because there's no way with the best will in the world that people can write a, about an album with if they you, if they find out about it a week before. Yeah, and if you're my bloody Valentine or Radiohead or something and you've got millions of fans champing at the bit to hear your new stuff, then you can rush release something. You can post a, 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 you know, a tweet on the Friday night and Saturday you can release the album. But, you know, you're a, an unknown band. No one cares whether you release something or not. So try and prep people as much as possible. Another thing to bear in mind is that there are actual seasons in the music industry. Um... It's, it's, you know, most people 
if you just think about it logically, the summer is festival season right now. There's like that that goes pretty much you know May Ju May to September, but ultimately the summer months. And then there's Christmas time, so it's novelty songs and greatest hits compilations and that sort of stuff, right? And people are on holiday on, at both of those times as well. So th the main times that you'll see bands touring and releasing records are in springtime and autumn, as a general rule. But if, if everyone's doing that, then perhaps you should actually not do that. I, I, I think it's actually quite a good idea to release things perhaps not on the same weekend as Glastonbury or, or whatever it may be, but just, just think outside the box a little bit. Uh, a good example, I think, is like Franz Ferdinand's massive breakthrough hit, Take Me Out. That was released um, at the beginning of January 2004, I think it was 2004, um, when no one else was really releasing singles. And because they had a lot of love from the music press and radio and everything, um, most people weren't releasing singles that week, which was probably one of the reasons why it went top 10. Now, if, if everyone had been releasing stuff that week, I'm not saying that Franz wouldn't have got top, top 10, they, but they might not have. Uh, and, you know, you capitalize on the fact that people are just coming back from work, that they actually do want something to write about or um, tell people about, blog about, play on the radio. They do want something fresh. The, the novelty tunes are out of the way. The greatest hits have been, uh, you know, bought and given to Granny f at Christmas and all that sort of stuff. You know, th think about a time that might actually maximize your own uh, potential just for, for being noticed. The other thing to um, consider, and we've touched on this in so far as, you know, you should be making sure that you contact the, the right person. Uh, very often these days, it's, you can, the newspaper or the publication will actually have the email of the journalist in there. And add this with a, a couple of the local newspapers here. Both their emails were in the paper. Um, both of them um, had phone numbers in there. And I called them both up and one of them wrote about this, wrote a preview about this event. So it's that straightforward, especially with local newspapers. A lot They are very much there to cover things going on in the community. So if you are based in Haddington or North Berwick or Musselburgh and you're doing a gig here, then you'll find there's a lot of willingness to actually cover it because most people don't, most people don't think about that. Um, most PRs, the people whose job it is to actually get you coverage, um, are worthless. They won't even go to, they don't even come to me writing for a national newspaper. Um, so they won't even bother going to a, a local paper who are often really supportive, especially if you've got a nice photograph. Um, they've, they'll love having a nice photograph and they'll love the fact that you've made an effort to contact them. And they don't necessarily even need to be into into your music is just because it's a good news story. It's an even better news story if you're doing something a bit um, original, if you're doing your gig in an unusual venue or you're actually making a, an event out of it. Or in fact, if you've got something that um, maybe someone's picked up on you, um, you've got a celebrity fan or someone's been, a, all of these things are us beyond uh, what you'd regard as a normal story. And connect to your local blogs, your local radio stations, your local... Because these people will be champions. They want to get behind you. They want you to do well. Uh, and you should, like, you know, take pleasure in every little step. Yeah, we got a review. Yeah, we got to play on the radio, et cetera, et cetera. I think the other thing to... And I'd like to bring uh, you guys in on this as well. From a social media perspective, you... It doesn't necessarily sell you records. Um, when we see who says they're going to come to one of our events on Facebook, when we've created a Facebook event, we can usually sort of calculate it's going to be about a quarter of the folk that say they're coming. But it's great that every time, if every time someone writes about you or says something nice about you, you put that on your Facebook and on your Twitter, then the impression it gives is that you're your event, your gig, or your, your release is getting all this publicity from other folk, and it, it reinforces the fact that um, you're getting talked about, and people see it and go, oh, right, you must be doing okay. Um, how much do you use social media, Tala, and how would you recommend using it? 
I use it a lot, personally. Um, we use it a lot at the venue. Um, we've discovered quite an interesting thing, though, recently. Through our fan page, uh, if we actually attach uh, like a YouTube link um, and let it actually attach so you can play the video, or if we attach a, a link to a blog or another website um, and it shows up as an attachment and not just the link, you actually get less views. We've done, me and JP have yeah, been Facebook, like... Facebook yeah, Facebook is skewed to native content. So if you actually upload a picture on your own your own Facebook site, it gets a lot more priority than anything you just link to. And that's just, that's just how they do it. Yeah, and if you just um, if you just say, if you tag people, so if you're like, we're playing with this band, then hopefully like a lot of their fans would see it as well. Um, and and if you just put like a, put a link, but don't let it, add the attachment, it's hard to explain, but you get a lot more views, it's totally crazy. Um, and I think it is really important to be on Twitter and to have a SoundCloud and a Bandcamp and um, get in touch with blogs. Blogs in, in this kind of, the kind of uh, stage that you guys are at with your bands, it's important to connect with your local bloggers. There are, are hundreds of them out there all over Scotland, all over the UK. And it snowballs, so somebody in Edinburgh maybe blog about you, and then Glasgow, and then Aberdeen wants a bit of you, and then it'll be London, Manchester, and that's how you can get more gigs. And there's a um, a machine, like a hype machine website as well, and it basically feeds in tracks from blogs. So I use Hype Machine a lot to find out about new music because uh, I DJ as well, so I'm always looking for new remixes and new, uh, just new original like dance tunes, like disco stuff and electro stuff. But it also is, uh, you can break it down into all the different genres of music. So if your band is tagged as like folk rock indie, if you go into Hype Machine and type in indie, it feeds in all the music that's been posted up on other blogs into this Hype Machine and you could, even for a split second, you will be the number one, the latest one that's added to that stream. So. I found Randolph out Sleep, not like number yeah. one blogged about band on Hype Machine one one week. Does anyone yeah. know Randolph Sleep? A, a few, does. a few, <laughs> a few of you do, but they're not exactly a household name. But you know, there you go. That yeah. will get them some coverage. Yeah. So um, blogs are a lot more important than people think they are. When I send out listings for all of our events at Electric Circus, I try and send them to everybody. I send them to Vic. I send them to Olaf. I send them to uh, Song by Toad, who's a local blogger. Um, in the hope that he'll pick out shows that he will like and then he'll write about it on his blog and maybe put up a link to your to your band's music. Um, and we send it to the Scotsman, the Herald. Uh, Press Association is a really good one to find out about as well because they actually feed to a lot of other papers. So I get in touch with the Press Association and that results in articles in the Metro. Uh, but they need usually about a month uh, is noticed because they plan their daily newspaper, so there's a lot of planning. Um, so you just need to give them time to be like, what's happening in Edinburgh that day? Uh, so, I mean, just blogs and find out as many press contacts as you can and don't be scared to get in touch with them and just know who you're getting in touch with. Yeah, and don't be too offended if people don't write about you or don't play you because there's there are loads of outlets, more outlets nowadays than ever before, uh, from the, the official, you know, broadsheet newspapers through to, you know, BBC radio shows through to commercial radio, uh, you know, blogs of all kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, don't don't get sort of put off if you, if you send your stuff out and, you know, it's not connecting with certain people. The chances are it will connect with someone else. Or you have to look yourself in the mirror and go, Actually, we're shite. <laughs> but, but hopefully that's not the case. And radio-wise as well, don't forget about student radio stations. There are loads just in Scotland alone. Um, Ali McRae started off in student radio. Uh, I started off in student radio. Jen Long, who does a show with Ali McRae, started off in student radio. And they all did it by doing shows that were new music shows on their student radio stations. Um, so that's an important avenue as well. And then they'll blog about it. They'll be on social media talking about it. So everything's connected um, and you just got to get out there. And yeah, also community radio as well. So there's community radio around here. There's community radio in Edinburgh. And these are often real enthusiasts. So you, you will get people that are getting in touch with you 
or you get in touch with them, but they are into what you're doing. They're into filling that, that time. I mean, what you have to look at maybe in another way is that newspapers need to fill space, radio stations need to fill airtime. Um, I believe that Scottish Television is going to be launching local uh, local TV feeds as well. So that's something to, to keep in mind. And if there's a good story, and this is the other thing with, um, in journalism, you talk about man bites dog because people don't, men don't go around biting dogs very often. So that's a story. Whereas dog bites man, lots of people get bitten by dogs. So it's not really particularly interesting. So always try and think about doing something a bit differently, not just in your music, as Vic said, but also in how you approach people. If you're just doing a, a release, anyone can put out, a, um, put out two songs. It's easier now than ever before, especially now you've got your, your vouchers and it's been explained to you. But the thing is, is then try and do something different, try and create an event around that, that release. For example, uh, Fence Records, right? They started off literally burning CDRs on a CDR machine in a cottage in Anstruther. You know, that is how that label started. Now, uh, even now, they don't have huge amounts of sales or anything, uh, but King Creosote has been nominated for a Mercury Music Prize. They, you know, sold tens of thousands of records as, as individual artists and so on and so on. But it all started from very meager, humble beginnings. But one thing that they did have was a story attached to it. You know, micro indie label from the East Nuke of Fife a fishing village, not even from St. Andrews, you know, and it's not, certainly not Edinburgh or Glasgow. So especially, like, people in the London media were, like, fascinated by that. And uh, they were like, what? You, you run a label from the middle of nowhere in a fishing village? They were desperate to come up. The culture show filmed them. You know, loads of people. They've had so much, um, you know, press and, and online buzz and radio play and TV just off the back of the fact that they are a wee label from Fife. So they put on strange gigs in strange places. Have a think about that. Lots of people do the, these kind of things, and quite often it really works in their favor. Scott, you've got some good stories about promoting stuff. and I've got a, a, a great story, which is quite uh, recent, uh, about a guy called, uh, I shouldn't tell you his real name, who was uh, in The Magnificent, uh, called Drew. But uh, he uh, recently invented an alter ego and uh, pretended that he was an uh, East German guy from the 60s and 70s who was writing music for uh, East German athletes to train for the, for the Olympics. But he, and he was stolen away by the Stasi and the East Germans and all this. Have you not heard of this one? It's great. And, uh, and he, so he, sent out just, he, and he just uh, sent out this music to various magazines and all that. And it's ev effectively magnificent without Tommy singing. And uh, they went mental. And he was in Spin magazine. He had a feature in Q. And they were absolutely mad about it because everyone believed it. He just made it up. And, I <laughs> and th that's, a, that's an extreme example where he's had to pretend he's somebody else and that it's such a good story that they've got excited about it. And now everybody's into it. And he's, he's just finished this Kickstarter. He sold like a 1,000 albums or something. Absolutely mental. So I don't, yeah. I, I'm not saying go out and lie. <laughs> But, you know, stretch the truth doesn't help. The Malcolm McLaren, Vivian Westwood thing of when they were trying to launch the pistols, they would write, um, like, terrible reviews. Of They'd say, I went to this club and I saw this band of sex pistols. They were the worst thing I've ever seen. This is terrible. This is the death of music. And they would send them to the music press, like, slagging their own band off. Of course, the music press would print them to try and create, a, 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 you know, a furore around them. They'd actually create negative reviews of this band to get... So everyone eventually was like, we've got to see this band. Are they, are they really that? bad you but know do keep in mind now everything stays online forever so if you do lie then 10 years time it might not be so funny if that lie keeps coming up or if you make it and people start as you've got journalist after journalist and you have to keep telling them that you just made it up if you do something slightly out of the box the chances are people will at least um, investigate it and and probably more likely listen to your music and they might even come along Stuart, what's the sort of thing that um, attracts the attention of online stores when it, it comes to promoting music? I don't think they're, they're really hellishly different from a lot of other areas of press or be radio. They're, they're kind of looking to see what 
what else is going on round about the release? So is it getting any radio play? Like is like is, is Vic playing it? Is is any what what DJs are playing it? What kind of press is is kind of planned for it? Um, have have there been any positive reviews? Um, are they doing any supports for 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 bands? It's all pretty much the same kind of stuff. They're all kind of looking to see what what buzz is there about the band. Who else is already paying attention to this? Why should we be paying attention to this? Without pestering people, keep in people's faces, like show them there's a reason why they should choose you and concentrate on your band or your songs, your project over other people's. But also be a, that's not just being um, visible in the online world, also in the real world. Go to lots of gigs, hang out with other bands, make those uh, human contacts. Um, I want to sort of mention quickly as well the point of mailing lists. And this is one of these other things that I see people getting wrong consistently, um, where if you're playing to 200 folk and they're loving your music, then you should be able to walk out of there with a whole load of females and be able to put, you can put them in a program called MailChimp, which is free. Um, this is incredibly useful. You can actually make, say, right, I played uh, the Electric Circus on the 8th of October, these are the 25 emails I collected at that gig. So the next time you go, you can, um, you can actually target those people. Um, if you play in Aberdeen, then you can get a mailing list from the people there. Try and, um, you're obviously gonna be wanting to concentrate on your music, but after the gig, let people know um, I saw these guys play to 250 people last night um, and basically they're handing out flyers after their gigs so folk know who they've just seen. It was the most mental mixture of people that I've seen at a gig in a long time and that's through going out and doing open mic nights, it's through playing to different audiences and then when it comes to doing your main gig that you've organised yourself, you know who's been at all the different ones and you can bring them all to bring them all together. So the mailing list, if you're not comfortable going up to folk after a show or you're too done in, then get some of your friends to do it. Um, give someone a badge, give them an, or, or offer them a free download in return for um, giving you the mailing list um, info. It's really, really important. I've seen amazing bands play to a crowded tent, uh, say the Go North stage um, festival. And as soon as the gig's over, whoosh, the crowd's just dissipated. They're going to be getting, they're going to be going to see some headline band the next thing. They're going to be drinking. You know, with the best will in the world, most of them will have forgotten who that amazing band was unless there's something to remind them. And that could be an email on the Monday going, thanks for signing up to our mailing list. Here's a free track. Um, thanks very much um, to, the, to the panelists while we're, Still recording, I'd uh, like to say thanks to the whole team that's made this um, happen. I've been on the stage a lot. Mikey's not been so much on the stage, but we've worked on this uh, together for the past few months. And uh, if you do have friends in other parts of Scotland, such as, or in the Central Belt, like Fife or Stirling, Glasgow, uh, let them know, because we're gonna be doing some um, some events along these lines there as well. This is the this is the first one. So we're particularly interested in your feedback for this because whatever you say we'll use to um, improve the next ones or keep sort of the good bits the same. And uh, yeah, thanks very much to Emu Bands and Verdon for sponsoring this and um, also to Creative Scotland and LJAM. Um, because without that, it wouldn't have happened either. So um, everyone's um, everyone's chipped in, and um, yeah, please stick around. Fill in the surveys and give them to anyone wearing an off the record T-shirt, except for me, because I have to pack my stuff away. And um, stick around in the area. We might want to interview one or two of you as well for our promotional film. And uh, thanks for coming. Thank you.